Jesus, I have decided to give you this. Really? Yeah. You do know that whoever sits here makes all the decisions, right? I know. I'm always making the decisions. But you, Jesus, make the perfect decisions. So why don't you come and have a seat and start making them? Wow. I'm honored. This feels great. Kathleen, guess what? I just got my new credit card. It's time to go shopping. Oh, uh, really? I thought you and your husband were trying to get out of debt. Oh, yeah. I mean, money's kind of tight right now, but I figured he doesn't need to know about it. So you want to go with me? No. No? Why? I mean, I don't know, so let me check with my schedule and I'll get back with you. Okay, girl, just let me know. Give okay. me a call. Okay. A cat? Yeah? What's going on here? What do you mean, Jesus? Well, I'm kind of one cheek in it here. <laughs> Look, I want to make sure we're on the same page. You do want me to sit here, right? Well, of course. And whoever sits here makes all the decisions. Right. So what's the problem? There's no problem. It's just that I don't know what I was thinking. Really, come sit down. Only if you're sure. I'm sure. Okay, you know what? Let, let's just start over. Okay. All right. Kat, I've noticed that you've been losing your temper a lot lately. Right. Okay, Jesus, I know what you're going to say. You do? Yeah, but you don't understand the situation. Uh, Kat, all I'm trying to say is that your attitude is a decision. Well, yes, of course, but I got a lot going on right now. I know you're under a lot of pressure. Uh, pressure? Jesus, you don't understand pressure, okay? Look, Kat, this isn't working. What? We can't both sit on the seat. It's either going to be me or it's going to be you. Okay, I know. I just thought, I didn't think it was going to be that hard, but... Here, just take it. No, I don't want to take it. You have to want to give it to me. Well, okay, here. Kathleen, make a choice. I can't. You just did. What we just witnessed was the battle for control. And we all face this in every one of our lives. Because we have to make a decision. Who is going to be in charge of our lives? Who is going to make the decisions? Who is going to be in control? You say, well, I am. I am going to be the CEO of my own life. I'm going to be the king of the castle. I am going to be in control. Well, that sounds good, but it doesn't work. Because when you say, I'm going to be in control, I'm going to be in charge, eventually you're going to relinquish control to something or someone. You are going to give to someone else the control of your life. And they're going to begin to form your life. They're going to begin to shape your life. They're going to begin to distort your life. They're going to disappoint you. And ultimately, they can destroy you. Unless you give control of your life to Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How can we let go and surrender our lives to Christ? You see, in all of our lives, we wrestle with this issue. And for some of you, the reason you're not experiencing all the fullness in Christ that you could, the reason you're not experiencing maximum blessing and maximum usefulness in the kingdom of God is because of this issue of control. And so we're going to look at the Old Testament scripture, and we're going to look at a specific story. You can find it in 1st and 2nd Samuel. You can also find it specifically in 2nd Samuel chapter 9. Now, you can read those later, but right now, let me tell you this story, because really, in some ways, it's the story of the Bible from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. It begins with the nation of Israel. And Israel was a very special nation. There never was one like it. 
Because it wasn't instituted out of the decision of man. It was instituted by the will of God. God chose to form this nation from a family of Abraham. And they had gone down into Egyptian captivity. And then God delivered them. They went out into the wilderness and they formed at Sinai a nation. The nation of Israel. And then God allowed them to go into the land of Canaan to have conquest there and to form a great nation. However, they were a unique nation because they certainly weren't a democracy. They weren't even a monarchy. They were a theocracy, which means God ruled. God was in control. God was their king. And it was the system God had chosen. They were to be dependent upon God. They were to rely on God. They were to hear from God. And when God needed something done in the land, he would raise up an individual. He would raise up a judge who would go and carry out the will of God. After a time, the people got very weary of this system. And they came to the last judge of Israel, a man named Samuel. And they said, Samuel, we want a king so we can be like the other nations. Well, that sounds pretty innocent. We want a king, so we can point to him, we can point to his palace, we can point to his throne. Uh, We don't stand out at UN meetings, we get along with the other nations. It all sounds fine, but it was much more insidious than that. Really what they were saying is, we don't want God to rule over us anymore. We don't want to be dependent upon God. We don't need God anymore to be our king. We want a king so we can be like the other nations. We want a king we can look to for government, a king we can look to for our provision, a king we can look to to take us into military battle. That's what we want. And Samuel was heartbroken over this. And so he goes to the Lord and the Lord says to him, Samuel, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. They have said, God, we don't want your rule. We want a king. And what's amazing is God's plan for Israel was to give them a king. His name was David. He was a man after God's own heart. But they wanted it now. And they wanted it their way. And so God gave them what they wanted when they wanted it. They got a king. And he was the worst judgment they could have had. Listen to me. Sometimes, the worst judgment God can bring into your life is to give you what you want when you want it. And that's what Israel got. His name was Saul. And he started really well. He was a handsome man. He was a very tall man, very strong and extremely courageous. And that's the kind of king you wanted. Because that was the days of hand-to-hand combat. And so your king would take you into battle. So you wanted a big, strong man to take you into battle. And Saul was that. But Saul also was a man who didn't want God's rule. His heart was the heart of the people. I don't want what God wants. I want what I want. I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. I want to be the sovereign of this land. So again and again, he disobeys. He rebels against God. And it was simply the heart of the people. They didn't want God's way. They didn't want God's rule. They wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to be in control. And that was their heart. And so within the nation of Israel, and in fact, within the family of Saul, everybody had this rebellion against God heart. (laughs) Except for one man. His name was Jonathan. And he stands out like a light in the middle of darkness. He was a man submitted to God, surrendered to God. He was the son, the very first son of King Saul. And you see him in operation one time where he is directed by God to go into a battle. And though he's overwhelmingly outnumbered, he and his armor bearer defeat and rout the enemy and give Israel a great victory because of his dependence and his surrender to God. Well, over time, Jonathan meets a man named David. David had a great victory as a young shepherd boy, went into the military and rose in rank. And Jonathan and David meet and they hit it off. 
Have you ever met anybody that when you meet them originally, you know there's something there? Uh, we have a common interest. We have a common heart. We're going the same direction. There was that spark in the spirit between them. And they know that they're going to be friends for life. So much so that they decide to enter into a covenant. Now, it's very important you understand covenant. Because covenant is the key to understanding much of the Bible. I think we should know that because our Bible's divided in two parts, the Old Testament, the New Testament, or it could be Old Covenant, New Covenant. The Bible's divided in covenants. And so what was a covenant? Well, a covenant was an agreement where two parties become one. Now, that's difficult for us to understand today because we really don't have anything like it. Today, we have contracts. But I think all of us know that if you get a good enough lawyer, you can get out of almost any contract. Or we say, well, marriage. Marriage is a marriage covenant. And yes, sometimes it is. But most marriages today aren't quite like that. Uh, They're based on emotions and they're based on circumstances. They're not really based on commitment. So we have no-fault divorce. And you know what the divorce rate is. It's really not a covenant But a covenant is an agreement where two are committed to each other for life or for death. It is said that some African tribes would enter into a covenant to where if a party violated that covenant, his own family would kill him because of the violation. That's how serious covenant was. And throughout the Bible, you see people making covenants. And so, when a covenant was made, there was a certain protocol to it. Sometimes it was between individuals. More often, it was between nations. And there were covenants that were of equal parties, but most covenants weren't. Most covenants were a suzerain covenant. And how a suzerain covenant worked is that a greater nation would defeat a lesser nation. And that greater king would come to the lesser king and say, I could execute you. But instead, I want to elevate you. I want to enter into a covenant with you. I'm the king. I'm the great king. But you will be a king under me to support my kingdom. And they would have a bonding together of these two kingdoms into one. Now, if they did that, they'd have a representative step forward. And that representative would represent his entire tribe or his entire nation. And they had steps they went through. One of the steps was quite interesting because it shows you the seriousness of the covenant. They would take an animal and they would cut it into pieces. And they would lay the pieces out. And then the two representatives would walk through the pieces of the animal in a figure eight. Symbolizing eternity. Saying this is an eternal covenant. And as they walk through the pieces, they would speak the terms of the covenant to one another. And they would say, may the gods do this to me and more if I don't keep the covenant. That's how serious it was. There were many steps to the covenant. One that was quite significant. Many times in a covenant, they would actually take their right arm or their right wrist. And they would have a symbol drawn there where blood began to come out. So they would cut it, blood would begin to flow. Remember, it's a blood covenant. And then they would put their wrists together, and it's actually where the handshake came from, and they would mingle their bloods. And they would say, we are bound together in the bundle of life. Our bloods have been mingled, and we have become one. We have become one. And they would say, and this is a saying of the Arabs, that blood is thicker than milk. So that you could have milk brothers, brothers who came from the same mother, who were biological brothers, but they're not as close as covenant brothers. And the term they often used was friend. That's why in Proverbs we read, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That is a blood brother. And that's the kind of relationship you'd entered into with a covenant. So David and Jonathan joined together in a covenant. Now, it would have included not only them, but they were representatives of their entire family. At that point, it appears neither of them have children. So the children yet to be born would be part of this covenant. And they make the covenant. They agree together on the covenant. 
And this covenant is renewed, not just once, but twice, and finally a third time. And the reason it has to be renewed a third time is because so much pressure comes on the covenant because of Jonathan's father, Saul, the king who didn't want to surrender and submit to God. He had an inkling, he had a sense that David was God's choice to be the next king. And in fact, he was. We know that in a secret meeting, Samuel the prophet anoints David to be the next king of Israel. But it was a private meeting. Nobody was to know about it. But somehow Saul began to understand that was God's plan. Now, I want you to think about this. If he was a king fully submitted to God, he would have said, God, if David is your choice, I will submit to that. David can be king and I will rule under him. But he couldn't. He wouldn't. Instead, he said, I want to be king. And with whited knuckles, he clung to the throne to the point where one day he takes a javelin and he hurls it at David to kill him. David has to flee. And from that point on, he divides his army between fighting the enemy and fighting David. They pursue David. They try to find David. And Saul would have begun to speak lies. We read about many of those lies as we read through the scripture. We see that he told his family, if David ever becomes king, he's going to kill all of you. If David ever becomes king, it's going to be a terrible day for the household of Saul. David's our enemy. David hates us. David wants to destroy us. Now, I want you to understand that was never David's heart. We know that because on two occasions, David actually had an opportunity to kill King Saul. And he could have become king, but he didn't. He said he would not touch God's anointed. He esteemed Saul higher than himself. However, Saul continued to lie about David. He spun a web of deception and lies. And what have we said about lies? We said even when a lie is, of course, not true, if we believe that lie, it will affect our perspective, it will affect our thinking, and it will affect our decisions. And it was affecting Israel. Well, there's a third time where they renew the covenant. And at that point, everything changes. Up until this point, Jonathan was to be the next king of Israel. And so you could say that he was the greater. But now he's recognized something. God has chosen David to be the next king of Israel. So I want you to hear this. Jonathan has to die to being king. He is saying, I deserve to be king, but I choose not to be king. Because David is God's choice. And unlike his father, he submitted to the will of God. And he said, David, you're going to be the next king. And I will rule with you, under you. And he said, things are looking bad. And so if anything comes of this, and if I'm killed, I want you to consider my family. And I want you to have kindness toward my family. That word kindness is a covenant word. Hesed. And it means a bondedness, a love, a commitment, a devotion because of a covenant. So he says, because of this covenant, I want you to take care of my family and my children. And at that point, he may well have had a child. We know he had one sometime around that time, a child named Mephibosheth. Now, why you would call your child Mephibosheth, I have no idea. But that was the name he was given. And If he knew about it, David knew that child was included in the covenant. Or maybe Mephibosheth hadn't even been born yet, but he's going to be included because his representative dad represented him in this covenant. Well, things go from bad to worse. And Saul becomes this manic depressant. He becomes this evil overlord, this really wicked man in so many ways, and commits some horrible atrocities and rebels against God. And finally, at Mount Gilboa, the unthinkable for Saul's family happens. Not only is Saul killed, but Jonathan is killed with him. They both die. And on that day, news comes back to the palace. Well, they've been believing the lies. So how are they going to react? They're going to react according to the lies. We've got to get out of here. We've got to flee because we know David. David will kill us. David will destroy us. So they flee the palace. However, as they're leaving, the little boy Mephibosheth is off in the nursery and they've forgotten him. So one of the nannies runs back. They grab Mephibosheth and somehow she stumbles and falls and the little boy falls to the pavement. 
and his feet become crippled. He becomes lame in his feet. He's unable to walk. And so they haul him off and they take him away. Why would they have taken him away? Because he's going to be the king in exile. He's in line to be one of the next kings of Israel. And so in most kingdoms, they execute the other family. So they have to get him away, especially believing what they believed about David. So they take him to a man named Maker in a city called Lodibar. And there in Lodibar, he grows up hating David, despising David. David is that faceless thief of my throne. He's taken my throne. I deserve to sit on the throne, but now... This man, David, has taken my throne. My life would be so much better if it wasn't for David. I wouldn't be crippled if it weren't for David. I would be king. I would sit on the throne. I would be in the palace. But now I'm living in this little shanty town out in the desert wilderness. And he is believing all these lies. And he's wrong because he's part of the wrong family. I want you to think about that very carefully. He's wrong because he's part of the wrong family. He is part of the family of Saul. They're no longer king. He's part of the wrong family. So think about it. He can take potatoes to bereave widows, and he's wrong. He can walk little old ladies across the street, and he's wrong. He can recycle. He can be very green. He can even buy a Prius, but he's still wrong. He's wrong because he's part of the wrong family. That's the situation. And so he's believing all of these lies. David does become king. He becomes king, first of all, of little Judah, and then all of the nation of Israel, and his kingdom rises in prominence, and he becomes a great ruler. And in the middle of all of that, he makes a statement. He says, is there anybody out of all of the family of Saul, that I can show a kindness, there's that word again, hesed, that I can show a kindness to for Jonathan's sake. What is he saying? He's saying, I have a covenant with Jonathan. Is there any of his family that I can fulfill the covenant to? And nobody answers. Nobody says a word. And why would they? Because most kings execute the other family. But finally, a man named Ziba stands up. And he says, yes, there is one young man, son of Jonathan. He's living in a place called Lodibar. And so Mephibosheth is back in his little shanty. He's hobbling around. I can just imagine. Because we know later on in what happens in Mephibosheth's life, he really thinks he should have been king. He could have been king. He said, I could be king. If I ever get my hand, I can just imagine this. If I could ever get my hands on David, I'd rip his heart out. If I had a knife, I'd cut his throat. If I could speak to David, I'd give him a piece of my mind. I should be king. He's destroyed my life. But all of a sudden, he hears hoof beats. He hears all of these horses coming in, and, and he sees a cloud of dust. It's the troops of David. They have come to Lodibar, and they grab Mephibosheth, and they take him back to Jerusalem, and they throw him down before King David, and he looks up, and for the first time, he sees the man he's hated all of his life. He sees David. He looks at him. And he says, a scoundrel. There's the man who's taken my throne. But David, when he looks at him, all he sees is Jonathan. He sees the faithfulness, the loyalty, the love, and the commitment of Jonathan. He sees the covenant. And of course, Mephibosheth was going to give David a piece of his mind, but now he's laying before David, and all he can say is, I'm a dead dog. That's what he says, because the fear of David has overcome him. When David looks at him, he says, oh. Oh, I don't want to execute you, Mephibosheth. I want to elevate you. I want to make you a prince in my family. I want to give you all of the lands of your father, Saul. I want to restore you to the kingdom. I want to make you a prince in my family. And you can sit at the king's table and you can eat continually. Mephibosheth can barely believe it. He's got a decision to make. Is he going to agree that David is the rightful king? Is he going to submit and surrender to David? Is he going to become part of his family, become a multimillionaire overnight, and eat at the king's table continually? Or will he be executed on the spot? It's a choice. 
but it's something to consider. He's going to have to say, everything I believed about David is wrong. David is the king. I must be submitted to him. I must surrender to him. Or, or is he going to say, no, I reject David. I reject your kingship. I should be king, and he's going to be executed. Well, listen to me. Mephibosheth was lame, but he wasn't brain dead. He accepts David's proposal. He enters into this covenant that was there before he was born. And I can just imagine, he comes into the household of David. And could, could you see this? This son of Saul who, who has to be helped over to the dinner table. And he sits down at David's banquet. And there he looks around and, and there he sees Amnon, the son of David, and Daniel and, and Absalom and Adonijah. And he feels very much out of place. It could be that Adonijah looks at him and says, what's that skinny, scrawny, lame son of Saul doing here? And at that point, he probably feels like he's in the wrong place. But then he sees King David. And he says, King David, could, could I please see your arm for a moment? And he lifts up his arm and he says, do you see that scar that was made there? That's because of a covenant that was made before I was born that gives me every right to sit at this table. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What a beautiful story. What a beautiful narrative. It's a picture of forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation and restoration. What an amazing story. But it's way more amazing than that. Because every story of the Old Testament is bigger than itself, and it speaks of Jesus. What we have there is the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Remember in the book of Genesis, God was going to be in control. God was going to be in charge. And they were to be submitted to him. They were to be surrendered to him. But man said no. I'm going to believe the devil's lie. Independent of God, I shall be as God. I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to rule. I'm going to reign. I'm going to call my own shots. I'm going to carve out my existence separated from God. That was man. That was Adam's original choice. And every man and woman since Adam have agreed with Adam. We're going to make our own way. We're going to do our own thing. We don't need God. We know better than God. We can figure out life on our own. That was the human race. We were in rebellion to God. That was you. That was me. We deserved God's death penalty. We had decided that independent of God, we could live better than dependent on God. In fact, we saw God as the cosmic killjoy. We saw God as the transcendental interferer. Some people talk like this, I know better than God. If God was really good and God was really great, why is the world in the mess it is? If I were God, things would be different. I know better than God. I can call my own shots. I can do things my own way. Man in rebellion to God. And here's what you need to understand. Apart from God, you're wrong. Because you're part of the wrong family, you're part of the family of Adam. Listen, you can take potato salad to bereave widows. You can help little old ladies across the street. You can recycle. You can be very, very green, but you're very, very wrong because you're part of the wrong family. It's not a matter of what you've done. It's a matter of being part of the wrong family. And you have rebelled against God in so many ways. That was mankind rejected God, in rebellion to God, and living in their darkness and their rebellion, they basically were saying, if I could ever get my hands on God, I'd kill him. And we know that because when God came in the person of Jesus Christ, we killed him. But God sent him anyway. And God sent his son among us. Listen to me. Listen to me here. He was of the family of man, but he was so different than the family of man. He was in the family of Adam, but he wasn't of the family of Adam. Jesus was different. You see, according to Philippians chapter 2, he was the only one who could say, I am God, and I can carve out my own existence, but instead he drained himself of his God prerogatives, and he said, I'm surrendered to God. I'm submitted to God. He said, I do nothing unless I see it from my Father. Even at the point where he had to make the most difficult decision of his life. Would he go to a cross? Would he take the sin of the world to himself? Would he die a brutal death? And would he suffer the wrath of God? And he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He was totally submitted to the Father. And he did go to the cross. And he did die. And he went into death. 
But he rose from the dead, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And then he poured out his Holy Spirit so that you and I, if we have faith in Jesus, could be engrafted into the family of God. We could be adopted into his very own family. We could become the righteousness of God in Christ. We could receive his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We could eternally be in the presence of God. We had this wonder in Christ, but we didn't know it because we were living in Lodibar. We were thinking if if I could ever get my hands on God, I'd give him peace of my mind. I'd tell him a thing or two. I know how to live my life better than God. God says do it this way, but I think we ought to do it this way. God says this is how life is, but I think this is how it is. I know better in God. I know how to meet my own needs. I know what's best for me. We were in rebellion. We were in rebellion against God. And then one day we hear the troops of God coming. I was there. One day, the Holy Spirit began to deal with me, the troops of God, and Jesus Christ became so real to me, and the presence of God became so palpable to me, and God began to deal with me, and he began to deal with me by looking at me, not as a traitor, not as a rebel, not as a sinner, but when he looked at me, he saw Jesus. He saw the loyalty, the faithfulness, the goodness of Jesus. And he wanted to reward me not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus had done. And so he looked at me and he said, I don't want to execute you. You deserve to be executed. But I don't want to execute you. I want to elevate you. I want to make you a son in my family. I want to make you my very own child. I want to give you my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I want to be eternally with you in my presence. I want to give you everything that Jesus has earned. And listen, I'm lame. I know I'm lame, but I'm not brain dead. And so I surrendered and submitted my life to Jesus Christ, and I became into his family. And because of that, I got to tell you, there's coming a day when I am going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember I said this is Genesis to Revelation. We talked about Adam in Genesis. Now we're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. And there's going to come a day when I'm going to sit down at his table. You know, I love that the kingdom of God is described as a wonderful meal. Because I like to eat. And here's what's so good about it. There's going to be no concern about calories, fat grams, or sugar. Isn't that great? That's heaven, folks. That's heaven. And so I'm going to sit down. I'm just going to be so happy to be here. And I'm going to look over, and there's going to be Abraham and David and Moses and, and Paul and Peter and John. And, and, and uh, I'm going to feel a little out of place. What am I doing with all these guys? And I feel a little intimidated. And I can just imagine Moses looking at me and saying, hey, I parted the Red Sea. What would you ever do? And I kind of feel like I don't belong here. And then I look over and I see Jesus. And I say, Lord Jesus, could I please have your arm for just a moment? And I hold up the arm of the Lord Jesus and I see a scar that's there where he shed a blood to ratify a covenant before I was born. And I say, gentlemen, I probably don't belong at this table according to what I've deserved But I do because of a covenant that was made before I was born. Because of Jesus, I can sit at his table. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a wonderful story? Story of redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness and pardon and being engrafted into the family of God. But for many of you, you've never taken that step of faith to receive Jesus Christ. But you can today. For others of you... This is an ongoing battle for control. You actually think you know better than God. You think God's withholding from you. You haven't fully given yourself to Jesus Christ, but you can and you need to. And let me give you three keys to surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. And the first one is you have to repent of self-rule. You have to repent of the notion that you're in control of your life, that you're in charge that you can do what you want with your own life. Because here's the thing. We were created with a vacuum in our heart. And if it's not filled with God, we try to fill it with something else. And the Bible calls these things idols. And that's why in Exodus 20, verse 3, we're told 
to have no gods before the living God, to have no idols. And many of us live with idols. An idol consumes us. An idol is what we're really focused on. You know how I know that? I know it when people pray prayers like this. Dear God, I would really serve you. I would really live for you if you'll only give me this. Lord, I'll really submit myself to you if you'll only bring this into my life. That this is your idol. Because you're saying, God, I don't really need you. I need this. And I really don't want you. I want what you can give me. And what I really want you to give me is this. And what God does is he begins to deal with our idols. And he begins to bullseye in on them and target them. And say, this is something that you must surrender. Because if you don't, I can tell you that idol is going to disappoint you. That idol is going to deform you over time. And it can even destroy you. And so God says, I don't want you to give yourself to idols. That's why the Bible calls him a jealous God. Because he's jealous for you. He loves you. He wants your best. And he doesn't want you consumed with idols. After we repent of self-rule, then we need to surrender ourselves to Christ's rule. We need to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. You do realize that when you receive Christ, that's basically what you pray. You pray a prayer like this. You say, I believe in my heart. Romans 10, 9, and 10, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and I confess, Jesus, you are Lord. And if you really mean it with your heart, God comes into your life, and then God begins to make sure that your life begins to align with that. That Jesus Christ does become Lord of every area of your life. And he'll begin to deal with us. He'll begin to work on things in our life. For some people, He allows the props to begin to get kicked out of their life to where they see that those idols can't sustain them. He'll begin to bring them to an end of themselves to where they come to a point of absolute abandonment and surrender to Jesus Christ. And once you make this commitment, once you decide, I'm going to surrender to Christ. And see, so many believers haven't. I'd have to say the majority of the American church doesn't get this. It's Jesus on the side, and I'm going to live my life, and I want God to bless it. That is not lordship. That is not Christianity. That is not being a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. A passionate follower of Jesus Christ says, Jesus, I surrender to you. I want nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else but your will, purpose, and plan for my life. That's it. And then you need to align your life to Christ's lordship. May we remember there's coming today, we learn in the scripture in Luke chapter 6, that they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus is going to say, why do you call me Lord? And you don't do the things that I tell you to do. With Jesus as Lord, we're obedient to Jesus. Which means that one decision leads to thousands of decisions. It's an everyday decision. I want you to think of Mephibosheth. After he surrendered to David, once he comes to live in his family, he's going to be tempted to say, if I were king, and then he'd say, no, 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 David's king. Uh, If it were just up to me, then I'd, no, wait, wait, it's not just up to me. I'm surrendered and I'm submitted to David. Maybe he has a friend come to him and say, Mephibosheth, you should be king. I have an idea. Let's find a couple of bombs, let's strap them to camels, and let's run them into the Jerusalem Twin Towers, and then we can take over. And he says, no, 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 I'm not a terrorist. I am surrendered and submitted to Jesus Christ. And that's you. Folks, every day there are decisions. Every day. I'm going to go over here. No, I I can't go there if Jesus is Lord. I'm going to say this. No, I I can't say that if Jesus is Lord. I think I'll look at this because that will meet a need in me that I have. No, no, I can't do that if Jesus Christ is Lord. No, I think I'll just hoard all my money. No, no, you can't do that if Jesus Christ is Lord. And every day, we have those continual decisions, is Jesus Christ going to be Lord of my life? And let me tell you how this worked out in my life. Because what I found, people that are really committed to God and really following Jesus and pursuing him, eventually, they had this lordship experience. I was in my late 20s, and I was passionately following Jesus Christ. In fact, I was a pastor. 
And I was very devoted to the church I pastored. I prayed for every member of that church every single week. I spent a few hours in prayer every day. I was constantly in the scripture. I was living a holy life and I was miserable. I was defeated. I was depressed. I was probably clinically depressed. And God began to deal with my heart. I'm saying, God, what am I missing? What's wrong? And he began to zero in on this issue of lordship. This was a definitive moment in my life. There was a three-day period where I wrestled, and God targeted. He bullseyed in on something where I was praying, God, if you'll just give me this, then I'll really serve you. If you'll just give me this, then my life will really be fulfilled. In other words, I was saying, God, what I really want is this, and I need you to get it for me. Instead of saying, God, you are what I really need, and you choose what comes into my life. But God dealt with it. And for three days I wrestled. I was like Saul for a while, holding on with whited knuckles to my throne, saying, God, I I don't know if I can fully trust you. God, I don't know if I can give up all my dreams and all my hopes and all my aspirations. And then finally, standing by the microwave oven in my apartment, I call it my microwave oven experience, but it took a long time to get there. I said, Jesus Christ, I give up. I surrender lordship. I give you the throne of my life. I am abandoning it, and I don't care if I ever see my dreams, hopes, or aspirations fulfilled. That thing I've longed for, I give it up. I don't care if I ever get it. I surrender it to you. And at that moment, it literally felt like Jesus Christ himself walked into the room. All of my fear, all of my depression, all of my discouragement left in a second. And it was It was changed. It was exchanged for love and joy and peace and happiness and such a sense of the love of God that I was completely overwhelmed. So overwhelmed that if you came up to me and you said, you're the ugliest, sorriest excuse for a human being I've ever seen, I would say, I love you so much. (laughs) I was impervious to sin. Temptation wasn't even tempting for about three days. God let me experience that. And then I came back to normal, and I had to walk one day, one step at a time. I had to live this out every day like we all do, because it's really about faithfulness and obedience over the long haul. But I was never the same again. I had come to grips with letting go of my throne and giving it to Jesus Christ and surrendering and submitting to his lordship. Now, there are people here today that you are so disappointed in your Christian walk. I know that. There's some of you that say, I'm not experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. I'm not experiencing victory. In fact, I'm I'm living a very conflicted life. May I suggest it's because you haven't settled the lordship issue. And God wants to do that in your life today. There is somebody who's listening to me today, whether it be on radio or one of our campuses or whether it be on live streaming, you're listening to me right now, and this is the key to your life right now. This is what God is dealing with you about. Everything else is blacked out, and there's this one thing God's dealing with you about. And until you settle the lordship issue, you're always going to wrestle. You're always going to struggle. It's always going to be a fight. But today, God is calling you. To abandon your own dreams, your own hopes, your own life, and to release it and surrender it to God and take the higher life that he has for you in Christ Jesus. A life of total abandonment and surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord. So today, I'm going to call on you to let go. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, that person listening on radio right now those at our North Campus, those at our Woodland Park Campus, those who are watching online, those who are listening to this DVD or listening to this cassette or listening to this um, recording, that, Lord, you right now are dealing with their hearts. You are dealing with their lives. And you are speaking to them about lordship, about surrender, about abandoning their life to Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, I ask you to zero in on that area that they've not been able to trust you with. 
They haven't trusted you with all their heart. Instead, they're leaning to their own understanding and they're gripping a hold of it and they're saying, I can't let go. I can't abandon this. I've got to have this. This is going to meet a need that God can't meet. This is going to satisfy something God can't satisfy. But today, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come down and begin to minister to lives and they would abandon it. They would release it. They would let go and let Jesus Christ have control of their life. And I ask that in his name. Amen.